George Kovach here from AIM Airway. I'm going to talk about oxygenation and understanding your equipment. And what I'm going to focus on is uh, this device, an important device for oxygenation and ventilation, obviously the BVM. And uh, when we start our AIM program, at the beginning of each day, what we do is we take one of these BVMs, we take it apart, and we throw it on the floor for people to put it back together. And the reason why we do this is this is a we think an important device to understand how it works, how to assemble it, and how to problem solve uh, through it. What we, I think, have come to assume is, again, this is a device that we put on the face and either it'll oxygenate spontaneously or we need to squeeze the bag and a fair bit of controversy um, around that and I want to address some of that in, the, in, this, uh, in this blog and, and subsequent ones. What we have to appreciate is they're not created uh, the same. Uh, this is the one that we use in our department. It's a reusable version and uh, made by uh, Laredell. And this is the one that's used by our pre-hospital uh, program. And they're very different devices. And unless you understand the differences, you have the potential to cause harm to your patient. So um, let's, let's get to it. In order to really understand how these work, we need to understand the relationship between flow and FiO2. So let's start uh, with, with FiO2. And FiO2 obviously is, is the uh, fraction of inspired uh, oxygen, so this is down at this point. But uh, the issue is it begins at the source. And uh, so the F, let's call it SO2, right, from the O2 tank or from your wall. And then there's the FDO2, which is what's delivered here at the patient, at the mask, at the interface between the patient and the mask. And then ultimately there's your FiO2. And in a perfect system, if your intent was to deliver 100% oxygen, it would be 100% here and it ultimately be 100% here. But that's not always the case. And part of this relates to, uh, to uh, the, the device that you're using and understanding flow. So when, and this is our, our flow meter, Usually we, we turn up, we're trying to maximize oxygen delivery, so we'll turn up to 15 liters. I know you know that you can go beyond that, but let's start for now at, at 15 liters per minute from the wall. Now, we're assuming that from 15 liters from the wall that you're going to get 15 liters here, and that's not the case. And there's been uh, a number of studies that have looked at the flow at the, uh, at the um, delivery point, and then it's roughly a third of what you'd expect. So uh, if you have 15 liters here, then you might end up with, with, with 5 liters per minute at the, uh, at the patient. And, and that's important because flow is critical because we need to match the minute ventilation of the patient. And let's remind you again, minute ventilation is equal to tidal volume times respiratory rate. And in the, the normal patient, normal varying according to size, that could be anywhere from 5 to 10 liters per minute. But in the patient who's, who's acutely ill, um, their, their tidal volume breaths are, are much light, larger, probably closer to vital capacity breaths, and the respiratory rate's going to be higher. So it could be at least 30 liters per minute. And we're not going to be able to deliver that um, with our 15 liters from the source, and definitely not since I just told you that you might get a third of that um, at, the, at this point. And so what, what's going to happen is with that, that additional flow is going to be usually from entrained air, and that's going to dilute your, uh, your uh, oxygen delivery, and you're not going to get the intended FiO2. So let's, let's, let's look at the device here. So again, we talk about uh, you've got tubing that's coming, coming from your source um, to essentially your, your reservoir bag, right? So it, it's coming in here, and as long as we get an, an adequate flow, um, then this is going to inflate, and we're going to have a high concentration of oxygen here. Now, there are multiple valves, and you need to understand how these valves work. This one's fairly intuitive, valve number one which uh, essentially prevents, gives you one-way flow from your res reservoir bag um, to, uh, to the delivery bag, right? So it's one way, it's not going to head back that way, it's going to head in this direction. Easy to understand. Most of these are what are called disc valves. They sound a lot more complicated than what they are. They're essentially just little rubber gaskets. 
There are two valves at the front end of the reservoir bag, and they're meant for, for safety. Um, the, the, the one on top here is an air intake valve, and the purpose of this valve is to prevent you from suffocating the patient. So if you're, you're not connected or you don't have this turned on, there's no flow here, that you're still going to at least entrain room air through here and potentially deliver at least uh, air to that patient. The, the, the second valve, again, which is meant to be a, a safety valve, and it's called a safety valve, and it's, it's usually oriented on the bottom here, um, it's to prevent too much flow going to the patient. So if you get 60 liters coming in here, um, you're, you're not going to have too much flow that's going to cause problems to the patient here, and essentially that's going to escape through your, your safety valve here. The problem is, again, is that these two valves, even though they're meant for, for safety, can affect the, the amount of oxygen that you deliver to that patient through, uh, through entrainment. Interestingly, as I said, that this one's on the bottom and it's a simple disc valve, so it's susceptible to gravity, and this valve can sort of fall off of that reservoir and actually uh, you can lose more of your oxygen and potentially entrain uh, oxygen uh, through that, that valve that's, that's flopped down. There are also intrinsic leaks uh, that um, aren't necessarily uh, intentional within the system that will affect the delivery of flow and make this a third of what you expect. So on the forward end of things, there's, uh, there's usually a duckbill valve, which as you can see is sort of this one-way valve that's going to allow your delivered oxygen or even your passive oxygen to get to the patient. And then there's this expiratory valve, which is going to prevent uh, your expired uh, um, your expired uh, air to, to uh, go back into your system and it's going to escape your, your, system, your system here. Those are the, uh, essentially the, the, the valves that are here. The other important one to, to appreciate that may be apparent on some, in fact most of them there, is, is, is this one. And this is not a valve, but this is a port. And this is a port for attaching your, your peep. And this, this port usually comes off here. Now in our system, there is no port. Um, so it is actually a true closed system on, on the front end. And there's a collar that attaches here. And then the peep valve comes off of, uh, of here. And I'll show this on a subsequent uh, um, blog. But what, what's important to appreciate with this port, if this is an open port here, then again, it's another uh, potential source of entrained air. So if you deliver inadequate flow for that patient's minute ventilation, then they're going to pick up that additional flow through entrainment of room air, and you're going to further dilute your source. So most of what I'm talking about here is about the, spontaneously, the spontaneous uh, uh, delivery of, of O2 with these systems, not through squeezing the bag. That's a separate issue. Um, it is no question that uh, you're, you're, uh, you're going to deliver a more consistent uh, flow um, NFIO2 if you do assisted ventilation coordinated with that patient's breath if that patient is in fact breathing. So I'm talking mostly here about uh, passive um, delivery in a spontaneously breathing patient. I'm going to stop here and uh, hopefully that made sense and more to come.